I got you covered. So, so I'm going to back up. So for, uh, we are looking for questions. We would welcome your questions to those of you joining live. If you are finding this on YouTube there, you can join us live too on the sex and relationship healing.com site. But I, I started mentioning uh, to Scott that I reached out to our drop in group host the other day. There were 19 people I sent a message to. There's 19 people volunteering you know, on a regular basis, most of them weekly to support healing of, for betrayed partners, for those struggling, you know, with addiction. So there's a variety of different things. And so if the day or the time doesn't work for you, there might be something else, but we have things like the internal family systems. We've got attachment wounds. You know, we have chem sex is on Tuesday night. So but lots of betrayed partner groups with different focuses too. So, so um, I would invite you to check those out. They're free. They're not recorded. So you do need to join live, but those are on the sex and relationship healing.com site. And we have bunches of work groups. I'm going to talk about those just for a moment. Those are different than a webinar or drop-in group, but Scott can tell you a little bit more because he does lead um, several of those as well. But we've got porn addiction 101 sex addiction 101 out of the doghouse. We've got inner child, um, Eddie, Dr. Eddie Caparucci's work. Um, there will be a new facilitator taking that on probably starting in July. I'm working on setting that up. Troy loves attachment work. We're going to start another work group uh, in September for those. We've got couples healing from betrayal. So th there's just a number of, I'm forgetting something too, but it doesn't, any, oh, the betrayed partner. That was the one I was going to start. So we have the betrayed partner level one starting again, June 8th. So please check those out. They're a low cost, six week course, live facilitated. So someone's teaching it. It's not just watching videos, um, but that, and where there's connection. So, and they are not recorded. So th that is also a safe space, but you know, where uh, you're guided through the materials and then, and I will pull up an image, but um, on Amazon, uh, we have complimentary work books that go with the work groups and the new betrayed partner workbook is going to, it, well, it's getting posted to, to Amazon. I don't, it, it will be up shortly, but that is, you know, kind of the exercises and information that has gone through, but obviously in a more robust manner on a, on a work group. There's a lot of work in there, but those are on the seekingintegrity.com site. So uh, continue to check those out. Dr. Eddie Caparucci is going to have the, the blind spots. You know, uh, that one will be launching uh, levels one and two, um, I think in August, maybe September. We don't have dates set for that, but I'm working on getting that settled as well. So, so we continue to try to have resources um, for you, free, low cost that help support you now and grow, you know, into recovery and healing. Um, and then of course, you know, we've got the, I really, I truly believe the most expert help um, in, in our residential treatment program at Seeking Integrity. There's no clinical team, you know, with a level of expertise that, that the, the Seeking Integrity team has. So, okay, we have a question. My PASA husband has been out of the house for eight months. We have an infant and toddler together. Our short conversations consist mostly of how unappealing I am to him. Oh, I e not a good cook, not good at cleaning. I've always been fat. He wants someone smaller and shorter, not me being a safe place for him to talk, etc. I did not know any of this until D-Day eight months ago, but now over the past summer, he's refusing me sex and saying we don't connect to which I would ask him what he means and I couldn't get answers. He isn't interested in doing any recovery except your Zoom meetings and he did do SA 101 last month. Is there any chance for our family? If so, what are the next steps? I am I am heartbroken for you. That's um that's just that's 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 horrible and there's um I don't know. So Scott, what are your immediate thoughts? Um, well, we've got a porn addict, sex addict husband. He's been out of the house for eight months. Um, unfortunately, there's an infant and a toddler, um, you know, and he is coming to Zoom meetings, doing, looks like, um, has done the sex addict level one course. Um, 
you know, is there any chance for your family? Um, sure, there's always chance. Um, you know, uh, the stuff he's saying, um, I don't even want to repeat it because it's just so awful. Um, you know, you know, I'll look at guys when they start telling me this stuff and I'll say, well, you know, did you find her attractive when you met? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I usually get some more honest answers. Like, you know, is she really that unappealing to you? No, no, no. I just, you know, I don't, I'm just angry or whatever. So I, you know, God, I don't know. I mean, and I don't, I don't think we can give you an answer. Is there hope for the relationship or not? Um, without a lot more information and some counseling. Um, but is there hope for your family? Sure, there's always hope. If so, what is the next step? The next step is his getting sober for real, um, maybe doing more than our Zoom meetings and, and a, a level one work group, which are great ways to get rolling in recovery. Um, but there's more to it than that. Um, you know, um, you need to get your support, which clearly you're here, you're doing it, I'm, I'm glad. Um, and at some point when he has some sobriety established and you've got some idea of what your boundaries need to be within the relationship, then the two of you can work toward couples counseling and reconciling, um, but you gotta kind of do this in the right order. And, and it's the situation is exacerbated because you have two little kids, um, which makes it much harder um, for you, because I suspect you're the primary caregiver. Um, yeah, and I'm just really sorry that you're, you're, you're in this situation, because nobody deserves to be treated that way, number one, particularly by someone that they love and care for, um, which clearly you do. So, and Tammy, thoughts? I do. Now I have, like, I've, okay. I was so heartbroken for you. Yeah. So, is there a chance for your family? Yes, you and your children. You will be a great mom. You will take care of those kiddos. So regardless of what he does or doesn't do, right. take care of you and those kiddos. Okay, what do you need to do? So first of all, I'm, I, I'm gonna push back a little bit. He is refusing me sex. Why would you wanna have sex with somebody who is untrustworthy? I mean, like, this isn't about, this, what healthy boundaries do you need for you? I mean, I would be like, yeah, don't, don't even think about it. And, you know, it, uh, like you can set healthy boundaries on. If you're gonna start criticizing me, then, then we're not gonna talk you know, when you're able to have a conversation about real things, including the kiddos, you know, um, because you, you will always co-parent, co-grandparent, but you, I say that a lot because people don't think the long term. They just go, well, if I get out of this relationship, then I don't have to deal with it. And you do like it's, you know, so, so here, I want you to have that frame of mind of what do I need to do for me? This is not about you being fat. This is not about you cooking or cleaning or any of this. You're the mother of his children. He chose, you know, he chose to have children with you and you chose to have children with him. So, so how do you both, you know, step into the space in a different way? He doesn't, I think it's interesting. He isn't interested in doing any recovery work, but you know why? Because there's no consequences for him to do things differently. So, so what, you know, what do you need to do to go if you don't want to do recovery work? I mean, he gets, to, you can't make them, but you can go then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to limit your time with our children because, you know, if it's, I mean, if it's safe for the kids, the kids need him too. So, you know, but what, what is it that you need to do to set up safe perimeters for, you know, for all of that? But th this is not about, you know, this is not about you, nothing you did or didn't do, how you look, how you clean, you know, he could clean if he, you know, if he was complaining about the cleaning, he can clean the toilets. I don't care, but, you know, but I would really encourage you what are you get help for you get support for you because you know again why would you want to be having sex with somebody who is quite frankly treating you horribly you know and uh blaming you for for things that you know it's absolutely his choice to act out so Whew. okay I am two years sober from porn, yay, and in a couple months into abstaining from masturbation. I have a CSAT and now sponsor and go to regular meetings. My wife still doesn't feel safe with me and thinks I've not changed and could go back to acting out at any time. She is so hurt and angry at the moment. I've never seen her this angry. I'm trying to support her, but she won't let me near. 
I can understand that there is something missing from me and my recovery that is stopping us from moving forward together. Any suggestions? Yes. Our treatment, residential treatment program. Honestly, I'm like not being, I'm not joking around that. Like, so here's the deal. You are two years sober from porn. So abstinent from porn, but you're, you've still been doing behaviors up until two months ago. Is that what I read? You know, that, so if, if part of your sobriety plan was no masturbation and, and really the stopping the acting out, whatever form it takes is, uh, yeah, a couple months into abstaining from masturbation, but, but that's just stopping the behavior. You know, uh, you can, you can still be untrustworthy. You can still be lying to her on lots of different levels. You know, she, you know, she probably didn't know you were still masturbating when, when you were telling her, look, I'm sober, I'm getting my two year chip, you know? So, so yeah, the disconnect you turning, like we, I mentioned the work group. So Dr. Rob's out of the doghouse is a work group about rebuilding trust. And if you have stopped the problematic behavior, then working on that, you know, could be you know, the next step. Um, I mentioned Eddie Caparucci's um, uh, work group that will be starting later about blind spots that might be a fit too. But you guys are in a lot of pain now. So Dr. Rob does a one-time expert consultation. Maybe the two of you could benefit from getting unstuck with that. But um, you trying to go to her and it, like, it feels manipulative, you know, if you're going to her and going like, look, look at all I'm doing. And you know, so, so it's, it is challenging. You need to do your work to really change. It's not just stopping the behaviors. Um, and hopefully she's got great support um, with betrayed partners and a good therapist, you know, to help her as well. So thoughts, Scott? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to take a kinder, gentler approach, which is not what I'm known for. Um, but, um, you know, if you haven't used porn for two years, great. Um, mm -hmm. You're a couple of months abstaining from masturbation, great. You have a CSAT, great. You've got a sponsor, great. You're going to groups, you're going to regular groups regularly, great. Okay, your wife still doesn't still feel safe with you and thinks you've not changed and go back to act, acting out at any time. Okay, you recognize that she's hurt and she's angry. Um, you're trying to support her, she won't let you near her. Um, there's something missing from you and, and your recovery that's stopping you from moving forward together. Any suggestions? Here, here's the deal for everyone here. Betrayed partners, you cannot get well for your addicts. Addicts, you cannot get well for your betrayed partners. What you can do as an addict is to stay away from porn, stay away from masturbation, stay out of all of those bottom line behaviors. Um, go to your CSAT, go to your therapist and work on things like telling the truth, telling it faster. Um, you are going to have to re-earn trust. And that process takes about a year of really good sobriety. Um, you know, depending on the damage you've done to your partner, um, you know, and, and, and continue to do maybe an early recovery because a lot of guys are like, I haven't pulled a lie in six months. Yeah, but for the six months before that, <laughs> between discovery and the first six months, you were lying, you know, like crazy. So sometimes it takes a little longer. Um, early recovery for both addicts and betrayed partners is a roller coaster. It's not the same roller coaster. Um, and you know, like roller coasters, we go up and down for no particular reason other than that's where the track goes at any given moment. Um, so sometimes as the addict, you'll do something you didn't even realize you did it. Um, that triggers her lack of safety. I'm being sexist, sexist with male addicts and, and female betrayed partners. That's most of what we get. Um, so you won't even realize you did something to trigger your partner's lack of safety. And then your partner feels unsafe and then your partner gets angry because it's been two years and, uh, and then we're spinning and we're doing the dance again. Um, and it, it just takes a while. Um, so I'm gonna tell you, hang in there if you need a higher level of care, we certainly have it. Um, it is certainly available. Um, come to the online work groups, come into treatment if you're really struggling. Um, you need to get sober. She needs to start feeling safe. And then we, meaning the two of you, can work on the relationship together. Um, but you both need some solid footing <coughs> under you 
And for both of you, that includes kind of a recovery posse. Um, you know, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm reading this a little softer than Tammy did, but um, you know, you, you're very aware that she's angry and she has a right to be angry and, and that's a good start. Um, and you will need to start doing something different, but I'm not sure what it is right now, again, without having more information for the two of you. Um, but you can ask her, what else would you like me to be doing? What else can I do that would help you feel safer around me? Um, you know, that's the step I would take right now. Ask what you can do to help her feel safer. Um, and that's a great idea. And, you know, hopefully you're doing like the check-ins, like the Thanos check-in every day. So you're getting kind of a gauge on, you know, is there lots of other stuff in her life? But but part of my, um, it, it's like, you, you you know, it's easy to go, yeah, I'm two years sober. But but here's the day, you're two months sober. You know, you're a couple months because, you know, if you're still doing those behaviors, you're still keeping the dopamine, you're still using, it's like an alcoholic um, I, we get a lot, a lot of this, like, you know, oh, well, I, I, I'm not drinking. I've been, I've been sober in AA for and like years. Great. But they've been sexually acting out like crazy. So, so they haven't been happy, joyous and free. Cause you know, because of that, you know, Scott and I both, you know, had multiple issues we we're struggling with. And yet, you know, yes, we have different sobriety dates, you know, for those particular things, you know, and we made some traction with it, but really the deeper work for me was, you know, when, you know, you know, as I kept, you know, getting, more help in in those areas so you know and i hear you have a sponsor so hopefully you're you know contacting your sponsor i didn't hear that you're working the steps i'm assuming you are and hopefully you know with two years you've you know you've you're you know hopefully you've done them and you're redoing them again but you know it really is you know the level of engagement yeah you know, and i love going to groups but it's also participating in groups and you know and shifting so so the more you continue to do, you know, it's still early in your recovery, even at two years, even, you know, if you set the clock at that, you know, there's still so much, you know, to gain and grow from. Um, but like Scott said, you know, if you're lying to yourself or her about, you know, other things that, you know, that comes through. So um, it, that making sure that you're a person of integrity across the board, you know, can help, but it is also time Re, you know trust is rebuilt over time so and actions okay next question i have been working on my recovery for the past year with covenant eyes support groups meetings and workshops i'm facing intimacy issues which my spouse is not happy with and blames me that i'm watching porn again how do i deal with that i do not discuss recovery with my spouse and she is not willing to seek help for her trauma and thinks therapy is all fake oh okay um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here. Um, Please. When, when you say I am facing intimacy issues, um, that can mean about a hundred different things. Um, most sex and porn addicts, when, when I meet them, um, they use the word intimacy as a synonym for sex. Um, mm -hmm. So when I hear you say I am facing intimacy issues, I am assuming that you're struggling with erectile dysfunction, probably, particularly if you're a porn addict. Um, but in reality, I just want to be clear, intimacy has very little to do with sex. Intimacy is the emotional connection that I have with another person. Sexual intimacy comes if Tammy and I are in a relationship and we're very emotionally connected and, you know, we've just, I've just shared about, you know, everything that's going on with me today and she shared about everything that's going on with her and, you know, we held each other and, you know, and then, you know, we're feeling very close to each other, whether we had a good day or a bad day. And then that escalates into sexual intimacy. It's a very intimate, connected kind of sex. Um, and yeah, that's intimacy because there's this real emotional connection. Not that, you know, a quickie um, up against the kitchen counter is not intimate if we already have good emotional intimacy. I mean, that can be really intimate in its own weird way uh, and really hot, but intimacy starts emotionally. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, when you say intimacy, but I'm gonna read this question as the intimacy issues being ED, jump into the chat feature and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so 
<coughs> been in recovery for the past year with Covenant Eyes, which is a filtering and monitoring software for people who don't know. We do recommend using those. Um, I, I prefer Net Nanny personally, but Covenant Eyes is very good. Uh, going to support groups and meetings and workshops. I don't know if that means our work groups or workshops elsewhere. Um, but not able to perform with the wife, and now you're back using porn. Um, okay, then I'm going to pause. Um, there is a thing called porn-induced erectile dysfunction, um, and it happens to male porn addicts. Um, sex addicts also have ED issues, but porn addicts in particular get um, pretty serious ED issues, and it's fairly common. Um, what happens is the brain, when we look at porn, we get a huge rush of dopamine and adrenaline. Um, and it's higher than the normal rush uh, that we can get from anything natural. Um, our normal baseline of dopamine is 100. We just randomly say it's 100. Orgasm gives us a dopamine rush of 200. Um, when we throw in pornography, it actually gives us a higher dopamine rush, much more like cocaine is about 350. Um, so it's higher than what we're used to. And it's this constantly changing barrage of imagery. And one of the really, really addictive things on this planet is novelty. Porn provides novelty in tremendous excess. Um, so here we are with an excessive dopamine rush and novelty, which is highly addictive. And our brain, we're pumping our brain for hours at a time sometimes. You know, porn addicts can go for six, eight, 10, 12 hours at the top. Um, I'm not saying you're doing that. You know, you may be going 45 minutes or an hour or whatever. But the brain recognizes there is too much dopamine floating around in, in here right now. I have to do something. The brain is, is a wonderful thing. It will recognize that something is wrong and it will make changes. It will turn down the volume on the dopamine. Um, what it does is it reduces the number of neurons that produce dopamine and the number of neurons that receive it. It has to go from one to the other, kind of plugged in like a lamp. Um, so it turns down the volume. Um, and so now, the, the unfortunate thing is when it turns down the volume, when we're looking at porn, because porn is giving us too much dopamine, um, it turns down the volume on everything. It, it's not a selective dimmer switch. It, it's a dimmer switch for all pleasure. So now, you know, first of all, I'm walking around not at a baseline of 100. I'm walking around at a baseline of 60. I'm basically depressed walking around. Um, so I'm just trying to get back up to normal most of the time. And, you know, my spouse, who's gorgeous, who I love and uh, who I want to be with, um, you know, used to get me up to 200. Well, get, first of all, 200 is not enough anymore because my brain expects 350. And second of all, I'm starting at 60. So she's only getting me up to 160, which is not enough. I, you know, I can't get an erection. I can't maintain an erection. I can't have an orgasm because I'm not aroused enough. This is what's not working. It's not down there. That's functioning fine. This is not working um, because my brain has turned down the volume. Um, so you are going to have intimacy issues until you stay away from porn uh, and stay away from cigarettes and a couple of other things that'll, that'll keep your brain turning down the volume. Um, so porn-induced erectile dysfunction, it goes away when you get sober from porn and stay sober from porn. Um, and, you know, so your brain can readjust. It'll recognize, oh, I'm walking around at 60 and I'm not having this big blast from pornography. I'm gonna turn the dimmer switch back up and we get to our normal baseline. And then sex with our wife becomes possible and enjoyable again. Um, but that process, depending on your age, you know, anywhere from three months to a year, um, depending on your age and how deeply damaged you, the, how deep the damage is you've done to your brain. Um, so, yeah, and uh, so how do I deal with that? You deal with this by stopping porn. <laughs> um, I do not discuss recovery with my spouse and she is not willing to seek help for her trauma and thinks therapy is all fake. Um, Tammy, I'm gonna step away for a minute and let you do that. I'm gonna keep the sound on so I can hear. Uh, okay. Kind of 
So, and I was unclear because it says, it said, my spouse is not happy with me and blames that I am watching porn again. And I'm not sure if that means that you are watching porn or if she is thinking that you're watching porn. So I, I love what, you know, Scott shared and, you know, how that all affects. I also know that uh, for sex and porn addicts, having real sex with real people, especially ones that, you know, really, really care about, you know, that's a, a, a space of vulnerability and fear. And it's awkward and different, you know, to, um, to try to be connected in a real and meaningful way. So Dr. David, on, you know, on this has talked about sensate focused touch, which is, you know, not looking to you know, specifically have sex, um, uh, but having that connected touch. So, but, but what I really read is that there's a huge disconnect that you, that you are doing kind of recovery over here and she's just angry, understandably, but, but there's not a space for, for, for healing that. So, so on, you know, on some level, you know, I wonder if you, you know, if you do, if this is what I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that my, my acting out has been so hurtful to you. I'm working on being a better person. You know, would you permit me to share just a few things that I'm doing so that, you know, I can, you know, I, that I can do things differently and become a trustworthy person. She may or may not be open to that. If, if there really is such a huge divide in that, um, yeah, I don't know how you, you know, I don't know how you bridge that gap without professional help. And because um, that's what they, you know, can, can help you do, you know, I, it, it feels like you guys are on a more major divide with that. And, and maybe it is, you know, ask her, you know, what is she looking for specifically and see if as part of your recovery work, you can, you know, you can get to that spot if it, if it aligns with what your uh, recovery work is, you know, not everything does, but you know, if, if it does, then, then perhaps that, but, but maybe take the pressure off of having sex, you know, is there other ways to be connected and close? Troy Love, um, we, we had a webinar earlier today and he, he, he talked about this, uh, you know, quite a bit uh, on the webinar. So that will be posted on the sex and relationship healing.com site. If it hasn't been already, I haven't looked, um, but that will be uh, posted. Um, and, and so that may be useful for you because he, you know, he talked about some of those, um, those issues on that webinar earlier today. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, like the, to me, the biggest gap is, you know, she's angry and thinks everything is fake and you're, you're doing recovery work, but it feels like you're not able to, to communicate, you know, on any level about that. So any other comments or, okay, on to the next one, betrayed partner. Is it helpful for me and rebuilding our relationship to know my addict husband's treatment plan with a CSAT? background, two years post-discovery, one year therapy with a CSAT. I have asked to speak email with this therapist to find out what his treatment plan is, what kind of um, progression timeline is expected, and what kind of behaviors, actions, and benchmarks I should be seeing if there is progress change. My husband says, and you, you've got that, his therapist does not meet, speak, engage at, uh, at all with his client's partners. As he says, it is a contradicting, conflicting his focus on of the addict. I am confused as most wives in my support group check in with their husband's therapist every few months to be involved and get a more holistic view of their addict's process. Am I wrong to ask this? You are not wrong. I um, agree. It, uh, I, I strongly believe, and I know Tammy does, and I know our therapists do, um, mm -hmm. it is helpful for betrayed partners and for the relationship to know what the treatment plan is. Um, you know, what the treatment plan is now, what the treatment plan is moving forward, what we as uh, a treatment center recommend, um, you know, you know, treatment doesn't, treatment, you, you come to treatment and seeking integrity, you don't walk away cured. There is no cure. Right. For addiction. You walk away with a really good understanding of your addiction, a baseline of sobriety, some tools that you can use to stay sober, and a whole bunch of a whole big list of things that you need to do starting the moment you walk out the door if you want and to the support somewhere. to do them right and 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 you know here's who you call here's who you go you're going to go to this meeting that meeting i mean, get really specific um you know um 
I don't know if there are CSATs who refuse to talk to betrayed partners. I don't personally know of any. Um, your husband, for the, for the CSAT to talk to you, your husband will have to sign off on uh, a release form so that your therapist can do it. And if he doesn't sign off, then the therapist has no choice. He can't or she can't. They um, can but, listen though. Yeah, but you could put in a request that says, hey, you know, I've asked my husband, you know, multiple times for me to just, I just want to know what the treatment plan, you, exactly what you asked for here, which is, seems very reasonable to me. Um, and, you know, and, and a good therapist will take that request into therapy and say, hey, you know, your wife sent me a, a letter asking if you would please sign off so I could tell her what's going on. You know, you're never going to get specifics of what is discussed in this therapy session, and you don't want that. Um, but, you know, yeah, what the general overview is, you should know. Um, when I work with guys in my work groups, uh, you know, we do their circle plan, which is their plan for sobriety. Um, I encourage them to share it with their partners. They, they should get their partner's feedback. Um, you know, on that, uh, I think you should have input. You're, you're part of this relationship. And sex addiction impacts relationships horrendously and deeply. And you're part of the relationship. You have a right to be involved. Um, you know, do you get to micromanage his recovery? No. But do you get to know what's going on? Yes, of course you do. Um, so I'm, I'm actually doubtful that the CSAT has some blanket policy that says no. Um, Maybe, maybe Tammy knows some who do, but uh, I can't imagine. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some out there because there, there are some that are old school and would believe. So, so I'm going to, but, but here's, I'd say then, okay, perhaps you need to find a new CSAT because, you know, the, you know this, this feels like we're stuck. If, if your CSAT is adamant that we are not able to, that I am not able to be part of this, maybe it's time for you to find a new CSAT. That would be interesting, you know, to, yeah. to hear what the reaction is. But as I mentioned, kind of slid in, you know, just because uh, the therapist can't talk, that's that's correct, um, can't give information, you know, HIPAA and all of that without a release. However, they can listen. You know, we have that, you know, with with our treatment program, you know, we, we hear things, you know, even, you know, from a therapist or whatever, ever, that you know, we, we can listen. You know, we can't respond, but we we can listen. So, so it's one of those things where that, you know, I, I really appreciate that you put it all in caps and quotes. Yeah. Um, to me, yeah. that would be, well, this isn't helpful for our relationship. Yeah. I got to step back again. Okay. Okay. So, so my hope is that with you being able to, um, to kind of say, I'm curious about that, you know, um, I would, I would like to talk to the therapist about, you know, what, why that is. And if you're getting pushed away, then, then I would, I know so many, unfortunately, you know, um, addicts who continue to lie to partners, which is, I mean, it doesn't serve the relationship. It doesn't serve the addict. I mean, I know it's fear-based, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, how do you heal? You do things differently. You have transparency, you be a person of integrity. Um, you know, this isn't about the therapist disclosing any information to you. You know, other than, I mean, but how helpful would it be for the two of you to talk with the therapist about, you know, okay, this is what I, and look, he's making really good progress on this. You know, he's not doing as, as well on that, but a good therapist is going to want the collateral information of, you know, because addicts, you know, anybody could, but addicts in particular have been known to lie to their therapist for years, you know, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't serve them. It, it serves a purpose because otherwise they wouldn't do it. But um, if the purpose is you know, to go to therapy so that I can change, so that we can do better in our relationship, then this is how you do better in your relationship. So that's a really long answer. No, you're not asking for unreasonable. Okay. I'm the spouse of an addict. He tells me he meets many addicts who probably wouldn't act out if they had under. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to start again. I'm a spouse of an addict. He tells me he meets many addicts who probably wouldn't act out if they had understanding, loving wives. As understanding, loving wife, I'm curious how addicts are missing the love and care of their spouses. My husband spent over a decade pushing me away with very harsh and hateful speech, but it endured. But I endured and loved him. 
He says he experienced only shunning and disinterest from me. So that's a lie. Um, uh, and Scott, if he was here, he would tell you that he talks often to uh, the guys and said, you know, is your affair, well, I'm just using this example, is your affair partner, you know, prettier than your uh, wife? No. Smarter than your wife? No. Funnier than your wife? No. More loving than your wife? No. You know, um, so it's none of those things. I, we say this all the time. Dr. Rob said it on Monday night again. Nothing a partner does or doesn't do, you know, is why an addict acts out. The acting out is absolutely, it's like the first question we were talking about too. The, ad, you know, the acting out is, you know, is the, uh, it, it's, it's just like, uh, well, it's not just like, but like alcoholism is not about how good the alcohol tastes. It's about how I, it, it keeps me away from, lets me dissociate, lets me leave, numb out, whatever. You know, it permits me to escape and I have fear. I have, you know, inadequacies, whatever it is that's, you know, it's the underlying issues, abandonment, trauma, neglect, abuse, grief, loss. There's something, you know, that has happened that makes me compartmentalize and do the come here, push you away, come here, push you away. Um, but that that is a lie. And the next time your addict spouse says something like that, you just say, I know that that's the story that you want to tell yourself, but you know, that is that is not. That is not a truth. You know, I, I, there's nothing an addict or a partner can do or not do that can make an addict go act out. They choose to. Now, in brokenness, in addiction, you know, it doesn't feel like a choice. And I completely get that. Um, but once we start in recovery, we have options and choices. But how hurtful, you know, uh, of him to, um, you know, to, to say that about anybody else's partner or spouse either, you know, that, I mean, that's absolutely blaming, you know, other, other betrayed partners, you know, and, and giving an addict, you know, you know, you're off the hook because, you know, gosh, you know, you have such a horrible spouse. No wonder you act out. Well, that's, that's not true. They, everybody has choices. We can, we can do things differently. So I'm sorry. Don't accept unacceptable behavior. Okay, to you, and, and I say that, and, and I know how painful it is, and the, you know, pushing you down for a decade, so I'm not minimizing any of that, but, but I'm glad you're here, and you were asking the question of, like, you know, uh, you know, is this, is this language that should be, no, no, every addict should be supporting each other, going, like, we take responsibility for our actions, the pain we have caused, our, you know, our loved ones, the hurt we've caused ourselves by being disconnected. Okay, next question. Two months from the latest discovery in 42-year marriage. Oh, the spouse has gone from no emotional intimacy to overwhelming with love uh, emojis, wanting to kiss, hug, and snuggle. Love bombing. Um, all things I would want if I could trust. He lusts for sex with me, but I cannot find desire. Understandably. He actually had an unexpected orgasm the last time. How can I say no sex with no therapist and him toying with recovery? Just like that. What are the healthy boundaries that you need to, to put into place? How, how Dr. Rob says, I quote Dr. Rob a lot. I hang out with the guy a lot, apparently. But you know, he, why would you want to have sex with somebody you don't trust? He has shown that he is not trustworthy. And here's the deal. What I hear in this little snippet that you wrote, you know, I know it's a 42 year marriage. So it, you know, there's a lot more, um, but you know, so he was completely no emotional intimacy and now he is love bombing you and, and what a convenient way to turn the focus to, I'm going to love bomb you. And he's still not working on himself. He's still not working on, you know, on changing the things that change him. So, so I don't blame you for, you know, not trusting it. They're, they're, he's not giving you any reason to trust it. It really is a shift, uh, you know, to another focus, which happens to be on, on you right now. But this feels about meeting his need of like, I need to, I need to be lovey-dovey with you and get my sexual lusts, you know, met without considering the pain that he has caused you you know, over decades, um, you know, in the relationship. So, so I, 
we talk a lot about healthy boundaries, you know, on the various uh, webinars and um, things, but I would, I hope you're also going to the various betrayed partner uh, groups because they can support you. And one of the challenges, you know, with healthy boundaries is everybody's boundaries are different. Um, now, Dr. Rob did talk about like violence is absolutely, you know, on everybody's list, but, but, you know, like no violence. Um, uh, on either side, but but the reality is, you know what, um, you know, like with chemical addiction, you know, it's abstinence. But with sex addiction, like the three circle plan is, you know, has nuances, you know, depending on what the sexual acting out was. Um, so just like that, the healthy boundaries for you need to have the nuances of what's going to help you, you know, feel safe and um, and. Um, Scott won't be back. He he is ill. So so just so we'll finish up here. I'll do my best. Um, I will be. But anyway, so um, so what's going to help you feel safe and um, hold the the safe space? You know, I mean, I think it it would be fair to say, you know, I need you to sleep in another bedroom until you know. I mean, people do therapeutic. Uh, um, separations within the home, but having him sleep in a different bedroom, you know, when you, um, when you are able to step into recovery, when you're able to do these things, you know, what do you need him to do? If he hasn't done the sex addiction 101 work group yet, like what a great and easy, you know, uh, place to start at six weeks long, he'd have a, a three circle plan. He'd have some foundational pieces you know, for that. So we've got drop-in groups for guys I think at least five a week, you know, that, that will help him as well. So, so to me, you know, you know, husband, if, if you want to be close with me, if you want to repair our relationship, here's what I need to see you doing. And it is action, just like the other person said a bit ago about what he says, it really is what he does. And the love bombing would feel insincere, insincere to me and um and too much you know uh again the focus of i'm acting out over here and now i'm you know pouring all that energy you know into into you and hoping to dazzle you with you know with all of this so that i don't really have to work on me so okay next question can you describe an effective daily 10 step to do i've been told different ways to recap your day and address issues? That's a great question. Um, I am confident in the various 12-step books. There's a very specific. Um, I, um, I really like, um, oh, there's, there's so many um, good uh, resources uh, too. I really like, um, um, so there's a general path to the 12 steps and, you know, and that talks. Oh, here, I'll share you what I do with mine is, and I do it probably, I, I kind of really do it throughout the day because I don't have tolerance anymore for having things be, uh, you know, out of whack. So I, I'm, I'm quicker to do that. But I know lots of, of people and earlier in my recovery, you know, I would kind of take, you know, take an evaluation of my day at the end of the day because um, I wanted to sleep good. Um, uh, and I hadn't messed things up first thing in the morning, usually. So, 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 you know, I, I would look at my, my actions, um, uh, what, what I've done, you know, was I unkind? Did, did I do something that has, had I, you know, had I been less than truthful? Um, had I done something that could be hurtful, to, you know, that I recognize as being hurtful? Um, I, I, I have, no, I, I had a wicked sarcastic tongue. I, I, I really did. I had to work really, really hard on that. And that was, that was a 10th step item for me for a long time of really, you know, working on that particular thing. Cause sarcasm is, you know, it's funny, but it's not, it's very cutting. So, um, so I had to really work on that cause it was hurtful. Um, and so I think, you know, I think as you've done your four step, you're going to be um, able to identify where your weaknesses are, you know, kind of the things that you're more likely to have struggles with. And those would be the first things to inventory. But, you know, I always kind of take a reflection of like, you know, are my relationships in good standing? Um, is there something repair I need to do? Um, uh, if, if I'm struggling with a resentment, you know, I, 
do some intentional things to let go of those, you know, lots of times people don't know I have it. So it's up to me to do the work. So, um, but I, but I know that the guides, you know, even go back to the AA, you know, 10th step and some of the, as Bill sees it, you know, some of those things are really insightful, you know, on, on how to do that. But as with everything in 12 step, take what you need and leave the rest. What works for you? What helps you um, take that inventory on a daily basis and know that you're, um, you know, you're, you're doing what you need to do. Um, hopefully that's helpful. So, okay. Next question. Um, I'm going to text. Okay. I'm going to text Scott and just let him know that I got his message. Okay. For the first time, my husband is facing his trauma and often goes into depressive and pity party spirals. These can last days to weeks and in the past has used his victim mode to elicit empathy from me and bait me into connecting trauma bonding. I'm currently holding boundaries to not rescue him from his emotions, but I still feel so much guilt and get annoyed because he doesn't function well when he's wallowing. Am I being too insensitive? Will the ease lessen as he gets further into recovery? Thank you for asking this. Here's so a, a couple of things that I'm unclear about. I mean, you said this is the first time. So, so where is he on the recovery journey? And I say this because we talk often about not doing trauma work too early, too deep when you're trying to get a foundation of recovery. You, you, um, you indicate that he goes into depressive um, spirals and the pity party I get, but but the depressive, I mean, if he could be struggling with clinical depression, and I don't know, you're getting an evaluation by someone who's trained to address addiction and um, identify if there is depression, he may need, you know, at least for a temporary period of time, um, you know, some medication time release to help, you know, stabilize that mood. Not that it's a cure, and not that you know the pill is going to fix everything, but but it does feel manipulative to me too, you know, because he goes into the victim mode. So so I think holding your boundary, you know, of what do you need to do to take care of you, um, and you know, it's okay to say I can see you're really struggling. You know, you have your, the resources that you need. You call his therapist, call his sponsor, you know, call his peer support. You know, what do you need to do to take care of you? Um, cause I need to take care of me. So, so you are not being insensitive, but you know, you are not, yeah, I said to somebody, um, you know, you're looking for a partner, not a project. And, and so it is, um, and I don't mean to be insensitive either, but, but he, he has to take responsibility for his recovery and getting the help he needs. You can be there and support him working with the qualified professionals, working with his peer support, you know, going to a meeting, you know, um, me, uh, my husband is brave, but you know, he has a couple times said, you know, do you need to go to a meeting, you know, and like brave of him to do that. But, but it, I, I am in the space now where it's like, I know that he cares about me. He could see I was struggling. He knew that that would be a good thing for me. So I took it as, as what it is you holding the space for him doing the work but I think it's really fair. And especially when he's not in one of those depressive states to say, you know, I see this pattern and I, I, you know, I want to make sure that we don't keep, you know, just doing that same dance. So, so I want, I want you to know that when you go into a depressive state that I'm going to be here and I'm going to be doing my work and I'm going to be getting the support and I'm going to give you the space to go do the work that you need to do. But I do kind of question, um, you know, if he's facing this trauma, Dr. Rob said not too long ago too, you know, it's okay, you know, for someone to say, I need to back off on doing the trauma work, you know, cause it's, you know, it's, it's too deep right now. It is in layers, you know, and um, it, if they're not, you know, super stable in recovery, you know, that can be really trigger, triggering. And, and those uncomfortable emotions were exactly why we acted out in the first place. So, so, you know, it's challenging to find the right, um, the right balance of things, but um, it, just you, the message to you is, you no, know, you're holding your boundary. It's his issue. You can be there and I support you. I, I support you doing the work that you need to do to take care of you. I'm going to, go, you know, I'm going to go do a, you're here. Great. So 
hopefully that's helpful. But and yes, it will. The, the more you see that you holding your boundaries, otherwise you get sucked in and you don't you probably don't feel as good. You know, like you said, I get annoyed. So so that that's just kind of this whole pattern that isn't working. So how do you stop a pattern? One of you has to disrupt it. And you you seem to be far more capable of being able to to disrupt it. But you know, having like I said, the conversation when you're not in the thick of things may be um, useful too. I find um, having a plan, you know, like we're going to face this again. So what are we going to do that's different so that we don't keep doing the same thing, um, uh, you know, can be helpful. So, okay. We have no more questions. Anybody else have any more questions? Otherwise, um, a reminder that there are great resources. There's a betrayed partner group tomorrow and uh, oh, there's two. Actually, there's one at 8.30 in the morning Pacific time. And um, there's also um, uh, Troy Love's attachment wound. There's a men's group tomorrow morning. So free drop-in groups on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. The Betrayed Partner work group is starting again June 8th. But we've got the Porn Addiction 101 starting, I think, May. Um, no, it might, I can't remember. Sex Addiction 101 may be starting May 31st. And um, Porn Addiction uh, June 3rd or it could be the opposite, don't, but check, check on, on the site and out of the doghouse will be starting again. So lots of great resources, you know, know that we value you, know that we're here to support you. Um, uh, there is healing possible. I see it happen all the time. So, so, um, but again, for you betray partners, hold your boundaries that are safe for you. It's not punitive. What do you need to do that will take care of you? Cause ultimately, you know, that that's, you can't control an addict, but you can support your um, own healing. Oh, there's a question. Let me quick. Oh, is it possible for a PA not to have erectile problems? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, it depends on the length of time they've been using it, probably age too. Um, uh, yeah, but also, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, many don't, but many do even young, you know, 20 somethings, you know, can have you know, those, those issues. So, but no, as with everything in this, it's not all people do or all people don't. It's, it really is on an individual basis. And like Scott said, a lot of, you know, a lot of sex and intimacy is, you know, right up here. And so, um, and approaching sex uh, from a, a different standpoint, you know, can be scary, but I, and, and I, I say this with a, a, a little bit of caution, but many porn addicts want to have sex with their partners, but they're still fantasizing about the porn that they've watched. Cause unfortunately that gets stuck, you know, in the fantasy part of, of, you know, the brain. And so therefore not the fantasy part of the brain, but the fantasy gets stuck in the brain. And so they can replay that. So then they're having sex technically with their partner, but they're still, you know, in the fantasy part of their head. So, so all of those things are possible and true and not true, depending on, you know, the, the situation, but with, you know, in a good, healthy relationship, like Scott, you know, discussed, it really is about being connected in a real and meaningful way. You know, it isn't about orgasm. It really is about the connection. That's, you know, that's the point. So. So thank you all for being here. Um, yes, I hope Scott feels better too. Happy Memorial Day. Dr. Rob and I will be on next Monday night. So we, even though it's Memorial Day, we'll be uh, there. Um, Mary Franz, it, the Trust Solution is on the Wednesday morning. So join us for that webinar. Um, but lots of great resources. Keep coming back. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.